Hi, wonderful AP Human Geography students. And me and the frog in my throat <clears throat> are going to tell you about locational theory today. And um, I hope you got to watch last week's video, YouTube video, on agglomeration and uh, urbanization economies. And this will make a little bit more sense as we pursue uh, our study of um, industrial and economic AP Human Geography. Now, you know that um, location theory is the main topic today, and then I'm going to finish up with seven things to look for in the coming year uh, that manufacturers are trying to accomplish uh, post-COVID. And so you can sort of sit back and watch this yourself and see, oh yes, I learned about this in AP Human Geography, so this is going to be important for you, okay? Uh, <clears throat> But location theory is simply the theory of why companies choose specific sites to locate their factory or their plants. Now, location theory gives us ways to characterize um, where the firm locates, and hence, we can understand the preference of certain companies for certain locations uh, and why that they think why they are reasoning or what they're reasoning. Now, the number one reason all companies are in business is to produce a product or a good or service. We're mainly talking about manufacturing companies today, okay? So, what every company wants to do is minimize their cost, their total production cost, especially their transportation cost. There are two kinds of costs, input costs and output costs. Um, and under this least cost school of location theory, we think of three main forces that um, determine where a company locates. One is transportation costs. The second is the overall cost of the inputs, inputs being the raw materials or labor or whatever is going into producing something. And three, the economies and diseconomies of agglomeration which we've sort of already talked about. Companies may emphasize one of these costs as being more important than the other two, and this um, will also help us to, to decide what a company might be. First of all, the least cost um, ideas uh, around transportation costs uh, being close to a materials location. I bulk to value ratio are generally weight losing operations. Uh, when we think about lumber mills or refining an ore um, to make a, a, a more refined type form of the product for sale, we have to think about um, how close we are to the location of the actual input. So. One, uh, when we think of lumber, um, we, we live close to West Virginia where lumbering is a big industry. And there's not one time I've been on those roads and I have not seen a huge truck, semi-truck, loaded with huge logs, and I'm talking big circumference logs, and they are heading to a lumber uh, mill, a sawmill, that will refine those huge logs down into boards and lumber or pulp or whatever they are producing. Um, in West Virginia, it's mostly hardwood, so you're going to not see the pulp plants that you would see in an area um, such as maybe Georgia, where there are more pine and softwoods that are made into uh, pulpwood uh, products, plywood and that sort of thing. But anyway, um, you're going to see them going, and where are they going with these huge logs? They're going to a sawmill or a lumber processing plant within the state of West Virginia to process them. So <clears throat> this also just makes sense. Um, another thing um, that is close to the raw materials uh, uh, location is when I was in central Mexico doing research a few years ago, there were huge, vast fields of vegetables and fruits, and oftentimes, and Campbell's, Heinz, all the major uh, green giant, all the major producers of canned and frozen vegetables in this country, as well as fresh vegetables even, 
um, they had processing plants really close, maybe even right on the edge of the fields. They were so close to the actual product and plant, uh, the plants that were growing and the vegetables that were growing. And it was wonderful because you just knew that although you're buying something that's been frozen uh, and not fresh, many times it's fresher than the products that you get um, anywhere else because it's been processed immediately after picking, okay? So Campbell's wants to locate their factories right there in central Mexico. Um, now, you can also have market-oriented locations <clears throat> where you have lower bulk-to-value ratio. Um, these tend to be perishable goods that are more fragile, possibly weight-gaining goods. An example would be uh, if you think about um, baking. Your baked products, your baked goods, may end up being more um, the weight-gaining or they might be more... Uh, valuable after we combine the flour, the sugar, the ingredients, and then we have a fancy cake that we're going to package and process and sell. So this is a uh, what we call a weight, a market-oriented location type of decision. Also bottling, uh, bottling your juices. You want to have your grape juice um, bottling plant up along Lake Erie where we have massive uh, groves of Concord grapes for uh, processing um, brewing beer. Beer is often brewed and of course the bottles are heavy so you want to process the, uh, the beer and think about the cost that you're going to have to get your beer to market. Where are your markets? And you're going to think about the the inputs that are not as expensive, but then your in-glass bottles, which are more expensive to ship out. Um, car manufacturing is the best example of this because you're taking raw goods, raw products, um, <coughs> excuse me, and making a big, heavy car out of them. Um, you have small electronic uh, gizmos and gadgets and You've got glass, you've got um, lighter and lighter metals going into cars. We used to have chrome and heavy metals. Now it's a much lighter type of um, frame for the car and covering for the car. And so you think about how much a car weighs once it is produced compared to the raw inputs. And um, so just a few things there. The production input costs. Uh, uh, sometimes transportation costs are relatively less important. Uh, if the production input is labor-oriented, in other words, um, if you have a labor-intensive industry, such as modern meatpacking or um, textiles, um, cotton uh, fabric materials, mills, and that sort of thing, you have a lower labor cost. So your production import um, and input cost is not that important uh, to you. Um, then if you have a power energy oriented product you're producing, that you have a lot, you're using a lot of fuel input, you're going to look for a cheaper power. Uh, aluminum especially takes a lot of a lot of uh, energy to produce aluminum. Uh, back in the day, the steel mills down in Pittsburgh, um, they had to produce um, a lot of heat in their furnaces, literally uh, burning huge inputs of fuel to produce the heat that would make the, uh, the steel. So they are looking for, uh, to reduce those costs of production input. And then we have amenity-oriented businesses, which are highly specialized, and they pay their workers a lot of money. Um, they require uh, amenities for the workers, which means they need an attractive physical location to lure these workers in. They need social 
an intellectual environment to appeal to these workers. So uh, <clears throat> the big example here is your R&D firms, your research and development firms. Um, well, I'm thinking of two in particular. I'm thinking of Research Triangle Park, which is also just called um, tri the, the Triangle. And this is in um, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, North Carolina area. This is the Research Triangle. Uh, it's a metropolitan area, three cities that form a triangle in the Piedmont region of North Carolina. Piedmont being the plain that connects the coastal lowlands with the mountains of North Carolina. This is in between Piedmont area, gently sloping. And it's anchored by three major research industries and uh, universities. One is North Carolina State University, the other is Duke, and the third is the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, so these three cities form this triangle, literally this research triangle, and they attract people who are highly skilled and um, they are highly specialized and they receive big paychecks. So this is the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, North Carolina research um, and development area. And on the West Coast, we have Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is a region in Northern California that serves as a global center for high tech and innovation. It's located in the southern part of the San Francisco Bay Area. And it's roughly the, uh, if you look at the physical geography, it's roughly the Santa Clara Valley. San Jose is Silicon Valley's largest city, and it also is the third largest city in California and the 10th largest in the United States. So San Jose is a pretty big city. Do you know the way to San Jose? Um, and last, we want to talk about agglomerations. We already covered this basically last week, um, but uh, localization orientation, the, if, you, if the firm needs specialized services and specialized labor, uh, example was the garment industry in New York City. They located, um, we found a lot of other garment firms locating in New York City because of the need for the specialized services and labor. Um, financial services, the defense industry, uh, silicon technologies are other examples that look at the um, localization, agglomeration, uh, orientation. And then a certain companies have an urbanization orientation. In other words, they need face-to-face -face, face -face communication with suppliers and customers. Examples would be corporate headquarters. They're going to look at urbanization economies because they want to be in the center of large cities. And um, Hartford, Connecticut is the insurance uh, hub of the country for example, um, in New York City, of course, in Tokyo, and uh, certain cities throughout the world are considered, uh, they just need that face-to-face -face communication, and they're going to get what they need in um, advertising, law, law, law firms, investment banking is another biggie. So it should be clear that all firms, to the extent they're able to want to do one thing, to maximize profits, they have to minimize their costs. And all, and there's so many considerations, it just depends on the product and what you, the kinds of costs that you put into it. If it's high labor, if it's high capital, if it's just a transportation consideration to get the raw materials and to get it out to market, the perishability of the product, there are so many considerations to think about. But I, I wanted to, this is getting up to be a long YouTube, I'm sorry, but I wanted to also give you some trends to look for in manufacturing for 2022. I found this and I thought it is fascinating because the COVID-19 restrictions will hopefully end someday or at least die off. 
understand uh, ease manufacturing activity. And then hopefully soon we'll see some manufacturing rebound and we'll see uh, uh, some more product on the shelves because the shelves have been fairly bare lately. Uh, but there are still going to be challenges, supply chain issues, labor shortages, and inflation, to name just a few. And these are really, really bad situations that are facing our, not only our country, the United States, but all over the world. Against this backdrop, manufacturers uh, continue to switch gears because they're thinking of ways to help and serve their customers in the best way they can in the years ahead. So uh, technology innovation has taken the front seat for a lot of manufacturers now, and they have to be able to be very agile and to respond quickly to customer demands. So here are seven trends to look for in manufacturing. One is the onshore instead of offshore. Um, it's really important for a lot of manufacturers to minimize their dependency on communist China and on other trade routes that are impacted by disruption. So they're accelerating their supply chain resilience strategy. So a key trend will be in this coming year to tackle all reshoring facilities. And industries are coming back into the country of origin as much as possible. And since we most of us live in the United States and we are oriented towards this, um, this would mean that they would be seeking to reorient their main suppliers on the shores in the country of the United States. And this makes sense because oh, if, um, you know, if we have another major disruption in getting our raw materials, our resources, our finished goods, say from China or wherever, um, this is not good. So what we are looking to do in this country, manufacturers are looking to increase their reliance on countries that we have a good, uh, rep, uh, good uh, friendly trade agreements with. And that would be um, the EU, but mostly Mexico and Canada you're going to find because we we're into trade agreements with both of those countries. <clears throat> Second, we're going to find manufacturers supporting e-commerce or online uh, marketing and uh, those kinds of strategies, and also spending more money on customer service. Um, manufacturers have to keep improving their operations to support e-commerce and a quality customer experience. Rapid fulfillment of orders and delivery of orders, secure payments, uh, digital marketing, and online customer service will be the top priorities in the coming year. Um, the third one is additive manufacturing or 3D printing. This was new to me until my uh, one granddaughter was asked for and was given a 3D printer for Christmas by her parents. And additive manufacturing is simply where materials are produced in layers using a printing process from a printer that's sitting on your desk or table. And this is going to be transformative to manufacturing in the coming years. There are many benefits. Greater freedom of design. You can design something on your computer and then print off a model of it. Um, so you can make... You, you actually turn this out. You make this not in heavy, you know, not in this heavy metal, but you make an actual model of it off your printer. So uh, you're going to have sustainable processes you can use, a faster time to market, um, greater plant productivity, being able to completely make it right there uh, and change the design as you need to. And all with little or no added cost. What's not to love? Aerospace and defense are the top two industries that are really going into additive manufacturing. Uh, all guns blazing. And the car industry is also getting into this big time. The fourth thing is predictive maintenance. And this simply means 
it's a technology, a process of predicting what the flaws in your product will be and what the problems will be during the manufacturing process. The result in this is reduced downtime. Downtime means when you're not producing your product, and downtime always wastes money. I remember my first job out of high school, between the, the year between I graduated and went to college, I worked in a glass bottle manufacturing company. And it was hot in the summer. It was really hot because at the back end of the factory, there were the glass was molten glass being poured into huge molds. And they would be molds for amber glass, which would be beer bottles and Cremora bottles. Uh, amber is a colored, kind of a brown colored glass. Well, whenever we had a really, and I worked on the, in the front, of the factory on the leers or the, the glass packing, uh, bottle packing um, part of the process in this company. And uh, sometimes I sat and watched the bottles going by and inspected them for flaws, pulled them off, whatever. But when we would have a bad thunderstorm, and we had those <laughs> in Pennsylvania a lot in the summer, it would interrupt the process of the glass mold making in the back of the uh, in the back of the factory, and you could look back and see these molten streams, red streams of glass just going down and being wasted. Um, and obviously, it was downtime because every worker in the factory um, their their work their job stopped because I couldn't pack bottles that were not produced. I couldn't inspect bottles that were not produced. The mold makers couldn't, uh, until they got the timing of the, the molds and the machines. And the, you know, downtime is costly, expensive, because we were all still being paid to be there at our wage rate. But we weren't producing anything. So anyway, that's a quick lesson in downtime. Um, Increased automation. Automation is vital in helping manufacturers compensate for a worker shortage and eliminate time-consuming and error-prone processes from the plant floor to the back office. Um, technologies like artificial intelligence or AI, machine learning, and smart machines can improve decision-making and quality and consistency and uptime, which we know we need. Securing talent for the new workplace. Manufacturers are embracing automation increasingly and will keep doing this. So employees have to be upskilled or taught new skills to work in these tech-heavy environments. According to Deloitte, a major uh, industry giant, more than 80%, more than 80% of manufacturers believe that their talent pools are critical for their competitiveness. 41% of manufacturers, almost half of all manufacturers, have already formed partnerships, good, close working partnerships with tech ed institutions to develop employees of the future. In other words, manufacturers are getting involved with the training processes to, to be able to have employees that can do the job they need done in a tech-heavy environment. And sustain, sustain, sustainability is the last thing to think about. Managing operations in a sustainable, environmentally responsible manner is a business imperative. How many times do you pick up a product and you see that it says on it somewhere, it says produced in a manufactured in a environmentally responsible and sustainable manner. Um, this is an industry imperative. As the cost of energy and material rises and regulations get tighter and consumers and investors gravitate towards more sustainable brands and business practices, we're going to see that already man many manufacturers are connecting the dots sustainability, and profits. So keep looking for this trend to continue. Okay, 
Thank you so much. I'm sorry this has been such a long video. I hope it's been interesting in some respects. And again, uh, thank you so much for being wonderful students who watch these very unprofessional YouTube videos. And I did have two things to show you. Um, they're really not, I mean, this is a, an example of location being important to a firm that is obviously located on the river uh, for the transportation of raw materials downriver to them and possibly delivering product upriver. Although now most of the manufacturing um, is not tied to being on a river or on the Great Lakes for raw materials input or product delivery. Um, this was the old, the old uh, type of factory that you would need to, you know, that you would see most often when rivers were the main transportation. Then of course we went to railroads, now we go to um, semi-trucks, seems to deliver um, an awful lot of products. And I had this little uh, map as well to show the factory and the fact that the factory is close to a river and also uh, located on some major near some highways that seem to uh, route through so these are more the physical location is less of a locational factor in this day and age than it was at the turn of the century even um, in the early 1900s or whatever so uh, have a good day. Thank you for your attention as always.